So my name is Rick Walsworth. Um, been at VMware about five years. Actually was hired as a cloud foundation product marketing lead about five years ago. And so looking at it now, the VCF division within Broadcom is kind of validation. And, and you know, to some of the points that Prashanth made earlier, it was very challenging over the past five and a half years to really try to get mind share and try to get some momentum behind Cloud Foundation as part of it, just because of the fact that we were distributed across different business units. And what's happened since the acquisition and 11 months since the acquisitions closed is really just maniacal focus. And what the focus has done is done a couple things. First off, from a go-to-market standpoint, very clear vision in terms of what we're supposed to do relative to going to market. But at the same time, it's the ability to be able to essentially provide much faster innovation just because of the fact that we no longer have to work across different business units, work across different um, uh, engineering teams in order to get things done. Everything now is under a single engineering team. So as a result, we're actually now able to be able to deliver capabilities that quite honestly have been on the roadmap now for some times. We're bringing a lot of those capabilities in, absolutely shift, shifting left to be able to bring, bring some of that in. So what I want to do here is just first start with what are the problems that we're solving, right? If we look at, and as we talk to customers, what are some of the problems that we solve as we go through this? And when you look at customers' transformation strategies, when they're, when they're looking at their infrastructure, whether it be on-prem or, or based on cloud, a lot of them are essentially, you know, and, and we were responsible for a lot of this, right? We sold vSphere, 300,000 plus vSphere customers that essentially took vSphere and then built infrastructure around it, right? They're, they're using, you know, traditional three-tier infrastructure as a way to be able to deploy storage, networking, and then wrap security around that as well. But then they try, as they try to modernize, as they try to bring cloud methodologies into it, it becomes very difficult just because of the fact that they lacked a lot of the integration, a lot of the APIs, a lot of the tools that are needed to be able to deliver services into the organizations out. And so as a result, many organizations kind of took a look at the strategy and said, look, I can't, I can't scale. I can't innovate. I can't bring some of these new capabilities in. And so they, you know, they view cloud as the easy button, right? Where they came in and said, look, I'm just going to essentially go all in on cloud and I'm going to start to move my applications in there. But what happens as part of this is that they realize very quickly, especially for applications that haven't been optimized for cloud, it's applications that are much more chatty, costs start to get a little out of control. And so, you know, costs start to become a big factor. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing certainly a move towards repatriating workloads back on-prem from a cloud deployment. And so this is something that we're seeing our customers do. Now, if you look at what the hyperscalers did, what they got right, was the architecture. It's a software defined architecture running on x86 hardware, right? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Um, they put an orchestration automation layer that allows you now to be able to bring these together and operate it as a single uh, product and then deliver a consumption layer where now the consumers of it, which, which it could be my DevOps teams, could be my platform teams, could be the developers themselves, are essentially consuming infrastructure to be able to build it into their CI CD pipelines, operating as part of their DevOps models. These are models that are, are deployed and these work well. And so effectively what Cloud Foundation does is it brings together the best of both worlds. It brings together, you know, kind of the privacy, the security, the uh, performance that I'm getting with on-prem infrastructure, but I'm doing now so with cloud methodologies. And I walk through the platform architecture. I'm going to kind of just, you know, unpack that and then, you know, hopefully set it up for the demonstrations and the deep dives that we're going to get as we follow along. So if you look at the platform architecture, really we kind of look at two personas within that. There's your traditional VI admin, the cloud admin. These are the ones that we've been working with the past 20, 25 years as part of VMware. And so essentially what we're trying to do is we're essentially giving them the tools that they need to be able to build, deploy, and operate private cloud infrastructure and using cloud methodologies as part of that. And so we're giving them now tools for capacity management, tenancy management, so that now I can essentially build different tenants within the environment. And then as they go to operate, now give them the tools that they need to be able to operate at scale and really start to deploy some of these SRE methodologies as we look to be able to provide not only on-prem management of infrastructure, but when you look at globally deployed infrastructure, how do I provide fleet management out across a big, broad uh, spectrum of these users? And so that's really where kind of we're focused on that cloud admin persona to be able to help give them the tools they need to be able to do that. 
And as we walk through this demonstration today, we're going to unpack uh, how we're essentially making that work. But then now as you go up the stack and start to look at the consumers of infrastructure. So this is typically the platform teams, right? The DevOps teams. These are the ones that are essentially trying to build infrastructure as a service and then delivering it in something that's consumable by their users, which would be the developers that are essentially, you know, the, the business units that are essentially taking, you know, a combination of traditional VMs, containers using Kubernetes, Kubernetes as an orchestration um, construct, and then start to apply it into the different applications. AI is certainly one that we're starting to see a lot of traction in. And so this is now the ability for these consumers of the infrastructure, the platform teams, to be able to manage the tenants, the content that essentially gets delivered there, as well as to be able to operate this at scale. So that's the core VCF platform as we look at it there. But then on top of that, there are a set of services that are available, you know, both within the VCF division, but then also within partner divisions within Broadcom that give you things like private AI. I know that was part of the AI field day that happened a couple, a couple weeks ago. Disaster recovery using things like uh, VMware Live Recovery. So I can actually have disaster and ransom recovery built in as an add-on service. Advanced security, so these are things like intrusion detection and prevention that are now essentially available as a add-on that you can bring into the environment to be able to provide you know, deeper intelligence around potential cyber threats in the environments. Load balancing, using the Avi load balancer that I can map into these environments. Container operations through Tanzu and data services through Tanzu now as a way to be able to not only provide the underlying infrastructure as a service, but as I start to look at some of the platform as a service deployments, this now gives you a broader deployment across a full DevOps environment, full application environment, edge orchestration, and then workload automation as well. So these are some of the add-on services that get coupled with VCF as part of an Correct. overall campaign. Question. Uh, does the, does it, do the advanced services, are they something that's separately chargeable on top yes. of VCF? Yes, correct. So you have, we have the core platform, that's, that's everything that's embedded within VCF. Then you have the advanced services, which are add-ons that are then essentially an additional service above and beyond the VCF service. Okay. So, and Ray, your question, this, this is what's in the bomb, right? When, when we offer VCF, what's, what's in the bill of materials itself? And what I'll talk about here, you know, everything we're going to cover today is essentially what's shipping today, VCF 5.2, which is our go-to shipping release. Uh, Prashanth mentioned 9.0. I'll talk a little bit about how some of these things are converging as part of that. So as an example, today we have a lifecycle manager. We, we use SDDC manager as the lifecycle engine that essentially orchestrates the, uh, all the components within it and provides the ability to be able to provision and scale infrastructure at scale. Um, uh, a compute obviously based on vSphere, but then has the ability to be able to combine that with uh, advanced services around AI. So we use both a combination of GPUs and DPUs to offload that capability, leveraging vSphere as part of that. In terms of storage, obviously vSAN is our default offer, but we also work with a complete array of third-party external storage uh, that we bring in through uh, VVMs. Or I'm sorry, yeah. the ability to be able to use our you know, storage policy-based management as a way to manage third-party storage, much like we manage v, uh, vSAN today within the environment. So we're flexible. Obviously, we prefer vSAN. Customers get vSAN as part of the bomb, but they can also bring their own storage into the ecosystem as part of that. Uh, networking uh, connectivity, so this is not only NSX, when you look at our core software-defined networking platform, but also includes things like HCX, which we'll demo today, which provides the ability to migrate data in and out of a, an existing environment, as well as things like Ontrio. When you go into container management, we leverage that as part of that overall networking stack. Conformer Kubernetes, so within every VCF deployment, we actually have a upstream compliant Kubernetes runtime along with a set of supervisor services that get deployed as part of it. So what those give you, again, out of the box without any add-ons, it gives you the ability to be able to stand up, operate, and deploy at scale a production quality uh, Kubernetes environment. Now, when you want to bring in the advanced services that a DevOps team may need, then that's when we bring in Tanzu, because that has really, really that platform as a service capability that's built above and beyond what comes in the native uh, bill of materials. And then obviously automation and operations, that's the ARIA suite that we've had that's now transitioning into VCF operations and, and automation. 
So what's happening over time is as we move from 5.2 into 9, you'll see some of these functionalities now start to combine, right? So now there's still separate elements within it. Although we do release them together as a single release, we also have the ability now to be able to start to combine some of these things. So for example, rather than a standalone SDDC manager, that will now get integrated into our operations framework. So what it does is it gives users less GUIs to look at as they're standing up this, these systems, building out this infrastructure, and then deploying it. They actually now can consolidate some of those views as part of it, building automation into almost every step we do. So we try to automate heavily, not only as we're standing up and building this uh, net new infrastructure, but then as you go to operate this over time, and again, as, as I unpack this, we'll, we'll start to now look at some of the areas where we're automating that would normally have been a um, manual process. So when you have this uh, section around uh, Kubernetes and mm -hmm. you, you said that, you know, I, I don't want to go so far as just like the majority use case. You said the use cases, you're going to do something with containers. Yep. You're going to do something and you're leveraging your VMware, you know, Cloud Foundation mm -hmm. environment. But then if you do something, and I think the term you used was advanced. Right. Um, then Tanzu Correct. comes into the picture. Right. And previously there was uh, this notion of, well, you have a very simplified uh, set of offers now, but then you also have very selectively presented options. Mm -hmm. And so would Tanzu be considered the option Correct. if you know, you know or, you've, right. or you've, you've, and your partner have figured out, this is more advanced than what the quote unquote out of the box, out box. Yep. CTF does. Yep, exactly. What's the arbiter that you've seen in practice that helps people understand, all right, okay, we have just entered the advanced conversation now right. around containers, yep. Kubernetes. Yeah, so a lot of times it is, I'm, I'm running a full DevOps environment where I have a, a complete DevOps teams. I've got platform teams that are essentially trying to bring in net new partners at scale and start to deploy this at scale. This is when you start to look at that, that platform. Now, it again, doesn't have to be Tanzu. We work in a lot of Red Hat environments as well. So it's the ability to be able to leverage that upper layer, that upper layer, that platform as a service, now integrated in tightly. Obviously, we have tight integration with Tanzu as part of it, but we're not limited to only Tanzu as we do that. Yeah. And, I, and in, yeah, in one of the demos we'll see later, I think uh, Katarina is actually going to walk you through what you can do out of the box to be able to uh, help address those questions. Yeah, just at one day, I was at the, the Red Hat conference. Mm -hmm. and, like I would I would say that the, the, the discussion, the, the word choice that you're, it's 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 much clearer now um, because before it almost seemed like it was at the expense of Tanzu no. previously. So, right. so Tanzu still Tanzu, yep. but other partners like Red Hat, example, blah blah blah. That's that's still there too. That, okay. Absolutely. But yeah. but it's when you go into the advanced conversation, you've got this wider DevOps platform teams doing exactly. things and scaling the organizational part of it, not just the underlying infrastructure and simplification yep. part of it. Okay. Yeah, you got All it. Right. You got it. And so what I'm going to do here is walk you really kind of through what are some of the outcomes that we're trying to drive um, our, you know, using the platform, we're trying to drive our customers through. And so obviously, as you start, you, you want to be able to set up the cloud. So that's the day zero operation. I'm standing up infrastructure from kind of bare metal, running it out across there. And then what do I do to be able to bring that up? So we automate a lot of that. And I'll walk through those steps. Then I, I have the ability to be able to deliver infra as code, right? I want the ability to use declarative syntax as a way to be able to essentially determine how do I want these systems to look as they start to stand them up. Highly customizable as we do that. And then I want the ability to be able to automate infrastructure as a service delivery. So how do my consumers essentially take the components that have been abstracted out from the underlying infrastructure and now start to build it out as part of a infrastructure as a service offer? I'll talk about how to deploy and manage um, workloads, how to plan and optimize capacity. So once things are operational, how do I optimize? How do I reuse capacity? Because of the fact that, in, especially in a highly dynamic environment, you're constantly building and destroying clusters. And so there becomes resources that if you're not watching it, if, if you're not managing that and operating that carefully, that could be wasted resources. So how can I optimize capacity as part of that? And then how do I troubleshoot and remediate? When something goes wrong, how do I provide the ability to be able to leverage the intelligence that's built within the system to be able to come back and provide you know, much better troubleshooting and remediation. And again, as we look at it, we're really kind of targeting two core personas, right? We're looking at that cloud admin at the bottom there is the ability to be able to provide them the tools that they need to be able to automate delivery of net new services to be responsive to what the needs of the business are to leverage this 
you know, think about these uh, kind of workload domains as uh, building blocks, right? How do I leverage these building blocks as a way to be able to provide standardized deployments of this infrastructure at scale, but then also manage things such as cost and capacity? I, I may have the ability to be able to run uh, GPUs within a workload domain for an AI workload. So how do I optimize both the cost and capacity, but then make sure that I'm delivering the right level of performance as part Excuse of it? Excuse me, Rick. Um, I think it's great that you are separating out the consumer and the, the deployment mm -hmm. and operations. Do you think as your customers mature and go farther along the journey and on the maturity curve that those roles will collapse? Yeah, so it, it depends on the organization. We, we've gotten it through our C-tabs and a lot of our customer feedback sessions. We've gotten very clear guidance that, look, they're living today in different domains as part of it. Smaller organizations, you do see a collapse of those roles as part of it where they're wearing multiple hats as they go into the different modes of the operation. Larger organizations do tend to keep those uh, very separate, and they really want different views, different control points, different access control based on what those roles are. So we provide that flexibility within the platform to be able to do so. But, you know, as I said, we're really trying to focus on what are the core functions that they're trying to deliver. You know, for example, if this is the platform team here, they don't want to touch infrastructure. Really, they're not really focused on what, what's, what are the needs of the infrastructure. They just view it as services that they're trying to construct into deliverables that can pro be provided directly to the uh, developers. Okay. All right. So on the setup side, this is really about how do I automate these building blocks, right? I mentioned this kind of workload domain concept, which is really a concept of taking our core constructs, vSphere, vSAN, NSX, as a workload domain, and then how do I build and customize that so it specifically needs, meets the needs of an environment? And that's how we scale out, is the ability to build, the, build take these building blocks and now start to deploy these you know, out across these environments. I have the ability to be able to create all the network zones and profiles so I can actually predefine based on uh, security requirements, what are the requirements that users need as part of that, and then build that into the operational model so that if I have specific security governance isolation requirements, I actually put, put that into the policies Every time a net new piece of infrastructure gets deployed, it gets deployed as part of that rollout. And then I can actually map that into projects and tenants. So I have these constructs that get mapped out across the different flavors of it to be able to take the, essentially the abstraction of the physical infrastructure that I'm now virtualizing and then providing up as services into the different projects and users within the environment. And then also has the ability to discover net new resources. So think about it, I'm bringing new applications, I'm bringing new infrastructure in. We have the ability to go discover that infrastructure, bring it in and add it to the resource pool. And then as I'm starting to consume that infrastructure, it now basically becomes part of my operational model because of the fact that I've essentially expanded what's available to it. Now I can start to consume that as part of it. And again, we have complete tracking of that. And I'll walk through that in a little bit, okay? Second stage is really how do I drive infrastructure as code, right? How do I use declarative syntax and things such as YAML as a way to be able to essentially be declarative about what I want my infrastructure to look like? So it's the ability to be able to essentially use this as a way to be able to integrate this in with kind of distribution hubs such as GitHub. So I can actually now build profiles and, and build these standardized templates as a way to be able to deploy these applications at scale and to be able to use this to be able to trigger action so that I can essentially go in, use Terraform and Ansible as a way to be able to now automate this within a CI CD pipeline to, that when I need to expand a cluster, I don't have to tap the shoulder of, of the IT guy. I don't have to tap the shoulder of the cloud admin. I can now actually go in, use declarative syntax as a way to be able to build that out naturally as part of it. And then I can configure these workflows. It gives you the ability to leverage this automation as a way to be able to configure the workflows so that they're meeting the needs of, you know, not only the requirements today, but also as the requirements as I go forward. And again, all of the policies around network access, security, storage quotas, I build that in 
and then that gets executed at the um, at the deployment level when I'm going to essentially pull these out of the repository. Okay, so this is a core Rick, uh, building block of what we do. Yeah. Rick, I want to go back to one of the things that you were showing, and you called out the personas, basically the builders and the consumers. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, a very core to a lot of the things that you're talking mm -hmm. about here because it takes the assumption that there are consumers, there are developers, there are people that want to build things. Yep. Uh, so is VCF really that that you ha you must have these perspective, these individuals, whereas if you, and like VBF, it's like for the, the mom pa shop that just have off the shelf solutions that they need to keep up? Co correct. I mean, think of, think of it this way, really. VBF provides you the core compute and, and storage that you need to be able to essentially stand an environment up and then provides an operational framework to be able to operate it so that now I can optimize capacity and whatnot. But all of these advanced services that I'm talking about really are kind of unique to VCF. Just because of the fact you think about it, we bring networking in, right? So I've got networking, I've got data services management, so I can do database as a service within that as well. That's also embedded within the platform. So you get a lot more richness, a lot more functionality within the VCF platform as, as opposed to vSphere Foundation which is really more targeted, as you said, towards that kind of, that lower, not, not necessarily the small mom and pop, but smaller organizations that have essentially built around vSphere and vCenter, they now can actually use those constructs, but still now start to up at a level by providing an operational framework that works in there. Okay, all right. Uh, deploy managed workloads, right? So this, this becomes important, right? So how do I take these templates, which are usually you know, based on declarative topologies where I have the ability to essentially define what a workflow looks like, how can I take that and deploy that at scale? So once I build these templates, I can use these now as blueprints that I want to be able to deploy net new workloads at scale. And then I also have the ability to go in and update it. I can modify these to customize it to specific environments. And then if needed, I can put that back in my GitHub repository so that somebody else can use that at scale, right? And, and so if you think about it, the and one of the things that was talked about in the, the early session is the ability to have this cloud abstraction layer, right? Where I'm, I'm essentially abstracting the other underlying infrastructure and providing a consistent methodology for deploying applications at scale, regardless of whether I'm doing, on, doing it on-prem within my own data center, I'm doing it at the edge, I may have edge deployments out across there, or if I'm working across any of my hyperscale partners, that cloud abstraction layer now essentially provides the same experience. So as a user, as, as a platform team, as a developer, I don't really care whether it's running on-prem or in the cloud or at an edge location because of the fact I get the same experience. I get a, a very consistent experience as I start to build that out. And so what it does is it gives you the ability to do things like uh, approvals, right? If, if, I, if, if you make a change to a specific template, but you don't have the right uh, authority in order to do so, it'll send it off to an approval so you can actually do that. So you can build these workflows into deployment of this. And I can map things like load balancing to it. If I want to you know, optimize performance as part of it, I can use things like the Alvi load balancer, which is an add-on, we talked about that earlier, mm -hmm. to be able to bring that in to be able to deploy these uh, and manage these workloads at scale, okay? And again, I'm providing a flyover here. What you're gonna see in the next sessions are really kind of double downs and, and, and deep dives, uh, as well as demonstrations on this. Uh, Self-service catalog. So, we, we put a lot of focus and emphasis on trying to essentially deliver that cloud experience, you know, unified out to the users as part of it. So within the self-service catalog, you've got the ability to be able to create all those uh, mappings that I talked about before. I can create projects, I can create user accounts, all the catalogs, those get built into it. And then I can deliver a infrastructure catalog so that if all I wanna do is essentially just build infrastructure, I can select from the self-service catalog and then it invokes those runtimes that I talked about before but then also gives you the ability to customize these, right? So because you know everyone's a snowflake, so we do want the ability to be able to allow customization of these catalogs, and then it gives me the, also the ability to be able to customize uh, these at the same time. I can put governance into it, so that as I'm looking at what are my security governance uh, requirements as part of this, uh, I can actually build that into the policy, so that regardless of when it gets deployed, they can essentially, anytime they're deploying net new infrastructure, it's mapping to my security, my governance, any compliance requirements that I put into it, those get built in. 
as well as you've got an audit trail. So I can actually go back and ensure that if indeed, you know, 15 applications were deployed today, make sure that all 15 of those applications met any of the governance and security requirements that I built into it. So that gets built into the uh, catalog itself. And then, you know, I, I talked about this earlier, but the ability to be able to optimize capacity, right? How do I essentially make sure that I'm able to essentially monitor all the core telemetry that exists within the systems. You know, what's my CPU utilization? You know, what's my disk uh, usage out across there? And they'd be able to analyze that not only at a component level, but also gives me the ability to look out across a data center. If I've got a widely distributed environment, I can have a global view of what this looks like. So it really gives you the ability to assess what's out there, and then you can set rules to be able to prioritize how I act on what I'm seeing within that uh, so that I can actually go back and reclaim space, right? A lot of times, especially in, in a dynamic DevOps environment where I'm constantly building and destroying clusters and I'm essentially, I want the ability to be able to reuse that, uh, that capacity, it gives you the ability to go in and optimize uh, that, uh, that, and then I can also set policies and plans. So that if I, if I cross the threshold, I now have the ability to go in and reclaim that space and bring that back into my available pool. I see Jay's got a question here. So, so fiscal control, cloud responsibility, uh, motherhood of apple pie. Yep. Is this core functionality within the VCF experience or do you have to go to like Tanzu Cloud Health? Or well, this, this is all VCF. This is all, all VCF. core VCF platform. Correct. Okay. Okay. That's part of it. And so if there was a VCF that was instantiated for a hyperscaler, mm -hmm. um, shows up and appears here. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Right. The, the, like I said, the experience is consistent regardless of where it's deployed, on-prem, at the edge, or within a CSP or hyperclear, uh, hyperscaler deployment. Okay. okay. Very yeah. clear. Thank you. Okay. And it's all rules API driven? Kind it, of it's all API driven. Exactly. You've got the ability to be able to uh, augment that any way you want to, to build it in. Because we know that you may be operating in a higher level uh, platform from a management standpoint. We use those APIs as a way to be able to plug into that. Same time. So Rick, let me ask you a, a difficult question. Um, so a lot of things that I've seen so far, I've, I've kind of heard in a different way. Mm -hmm. For instance, you show Git and you show all those different things in, in the policies. Those things existed within ARIA you know, automation. Yep. You're showing right now what basically v Realize Operations was doing. Mm -hmm. Now that everybody has these things because they have to purchase these things, they get it with VCF, yep. right? What are we? What is VMware doing to help them start actually utilizing those? Consume solutions? it. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's a big. I mean, Prashant talked about that a little bit. But when we do that jump start, it's really the ability to be able to first off understand what are the tools that you have at your disposal today, and then what are a lot of the best practices to be able to do that. So a lot of that comes through education, right? So we're just trying to educate them on what exists today. How can you use it? How can you essentially take advantage of a lot of the capabilities that I'm talking about here? And then how to essentially optimize it, right, is, is, is part of it. And it, it was always, I'll, I'll perfectly honest, it was always very difficult when we were distributed, you know, in, in the old VMware, I'll say, uh, just because of the fact that sometimes couldn't get the left hand to work with the right hand as part of this. Now that we're all together, this is actually one vision. And, and again, to your point, it, it's important for customers to take advantage of these things because of the fact that without it, it makes life a lot harder. We're trying to figure out how do we optimize their experience as part of it. Well, so I, I think it's good to call out uh, as, as a voice of a customer, mm -hmm. understanding these solutions and being able to use something like Git, something like automation, mm -hmm. something like a self-service catalog, something like, like monitoring maintenance and uh, governance yep. over all of those individual pieces. That, that's a lot for like a short jump start. I mean, these are, is, is there anything for ongoing support yeah, for customers that have to do that? Yeah, and so that's where really the training and certification comes in. So, you know, where we used to actually charge for training and certs, you know, for, to get the VCP or VS, these are now essentially part of the transaction. When you get VCF, you're actually getting the certifications as part of it. And, and they go deep, right, in terms of that. And then at the same time, trying to build best practices and build uh, reference architectures that essentially are blueprints in terms of how to do this at scale for specific environments. Um, so yeah, that, that's really what we're trying to do. I, I don't know that we got everything right 
So we're still, it's a, it's a work in progress, but that is what we've heard from our customers, what they want to do. And so we're trying to respond to those requirements. Yeah, I, I think, you know, again, I'm, I think you're going the right direction. And we, we discussed as delegates earlier about the importance of support mm -hmm. to customers. Yep. It, it's, these are good directions, and I like the directions. I think certification is key to understand overarching what mm -hmm. they have. I think that Jumpstart's fantastic because they get hands-on and start helping them down that way. Uh, but certifications and jump starts don't help them understand, well, I know how to do an Ubuntu box. How do I do a Windows box? Now? Mm, right, how right. do I get that joined into the domain and set up in my GPOs, which is always a spider web of insanity? Right. And right. then what are the next steps after that? I would, I would encourage, like, maybe there's some, some good opportunity for support because being an automation guy for the past, like, 10 or 20 years, I love all of this. I want people to start using it. I've seen the cultural changes that can happen from mm -hmm. automation, from using containers and things of that nature. But you can lead a horse to water, but you can't get him to drink. Right. But if you get bring him the horse to water, and then you bring the water to the horse <laughs> more, you might be able to do it right, a little bit better. Right. Yeah, so I mean, the other part of that equation is professional services, right? I mean, and, and we do, you know, have PS that gets coupled a lot of times with it. We're trying to do those provide out of the box. What are the basic things that you need to get off the ground to be able to take advantage of some of these capabilities? But then when it comes to customization, to really try to tailor that solution to a specific customer environment, I think that's where PS might come in as well. Uh, question here about the PS. Um, so the PS you plan to deliver directly from uh, VMware uh, as a part of your, for example, business unit professional services, or you plan to uh, move that to the partners? Well, so it's a combination of both, right? So we have PS, obviously, that's provided by our partners as part of it. I think Prashanth mentioned that earlier, that, you know, they're taking kind of L1, L2, as well as a PS, because that's a value add, right? If, if you look at it from their standpoint, yeah, the, the margin's interesting, but they can't build a business on it, right? They build a business on a practice, right? They're trying to build a practice around a specific discipline and then offer that as a professional service. So it, it's a combination of both. All right. I yeah, is to kind of build on on what what's been said, I, I'm I'm interested. In, I mean, maybe you cover this in the demos that you're about to get to, but I, I'm I'm kind of interested in the practical uh, bridge from where customers are to this grand vision that you you have. Um, like, there's a large established customer base out there that already has a lot of this stuff, and you've you it looks like you've done a lot of work to integrate it, make it actually easier to adopt mm -hmm. now. Do you have tools or processes or, or ways that make it easier for them to get to from where they are to actually implementing this stuff like piece by piece as they migrate across to the new form of VCF? Yeah, so absolutely, Justin. I, I think the, the intent is to be able to try to meet customers wherever they're at on their journey because we realize everyone's got a different destination. They're on a different path as part of it. And so they may already have pieces in it that where they, they say they don't, they don't need some of this. They, they, they have other tools that they use to be able to integrate into it. So we're not forcing them down here. We actually try to build best practices around what, we've, what we're delivering as part of this, uh, this offer. And then um, complement that with other services that might allow them to be able to customize it and bring it into their own environments. So it's a combination of both, I think. Yeah, it'd, it'd be handy if you've got like examples of like, you used to do this, now you can do this, um, as, as like a concrete example. Again, this is probably going to be in the demo, so I, I won't push it too hard. Yeah, I, I think some of it will come out in the, as part of the demos that, that we walk through, but let's make sure that if, if we don't get it through the demos that we do address that specifically. Uh, can I come back for a moment to this uh, distribution partnership professional services? Because it's not still clear for me. Uh, so we have the professional services support of the partners locally for the customer. Mm -hmm. That's what I understand. I don't think that it changed much because the relation with the end customer, it stays with the mm -hmm. partners, right? And those guys deliver the service, build the infrastructure, wherever it's needed to use your software. And then L1, L2 as a global uh, support service will reside in uh, distribution or will or you will still have it in a global? Yeah, so it, it depends. So if you look at our kind of large strategic customers, that'll come from Broadcom. Mm -hmm. So they'll get that direct from Broadcom. So this uh, customers that you uh, work directly with, right? Right, exactly. 
and the rest of the world. Uh, the, so the rest of the world, you know, think, you know, kind of the corporate down into the commercial space of, of our business. That's a combination of Broadcom plus partner support, because we are trying to essentially enable the partners to be able to provide not only that first level L1, L2 support, but also the ability to be able to add professional services onto that as well. Yeah, but uh, L1, L2 still will reside on the on your site or it will stay in the distribution or in the partners? For for commercial mm -hmm. for commercial customers, L1, L2 comes from our partners. So uh, that, that partners. comes from our partners as mm -hmm. part of that. Uh, and they have direct line into that and then escalation to Broadcom as needed. Mm, okay. So leaving aside support for a moment, professional services wise, there used to be programs for partners to basically incentivize customers that get credits and then mm -hmm. the partners could transact on them that, that kind of like went away prior to the acquisition. Any plans on bringing something like that back to help, you know, your customers get professional services from partners at a lower cost or some kind of incentive that helps kind of both parties, your partners and your customers in the adoption from a kind of execution. Yeah, I, I know that there are some credits that exist today. I, I, I don't work in that group, so I don't know specifically about it, and I can't really comment on plans go forward. But I think that's the intent, is the ability to be able to bring some of those uh, capabilities back that customers did take advantage of before. Okay. Okay, I got the uh, two-minute sign, so I'm going to... <laughs> kind of go back through here. Uh, so l last step here is troubleshoot and remediate is the ability to be able to, when something goes wrong, be able to make sure that we're providing not only the information needed to be able to uh, act on that, but also the ability to be able to uh, provide the right level of intelligence. Um, we, we talked before about kind of LCM. LCM has been a big function, a big differentiator of Cloud Foundation out across there. And this was certainly... Uh, a lot more important when we had the different business units delivering on different cycles and whatnot. And the challenge was always the fact that vSphere would release and deliver new features, vSAN would come with that, then NSX, and then VCF would typically pick it up one or two quarters later. We've now consolidated that, so we're doing a day zero support for things that come out for VCF today. But when a new bundle gets released, essentially, uh, I get a notification of it, and I get, have the ability to be able to review updates. What's in the build? Is it going to help me? Uh, provides the ability. I can do skip level upgrades so that, let's say, today I'm at 5.0, the go-to release is 5.2. I don't have to step through every release. I can essentially skip level directly to that. Um, then once I do that, it goes through a set of pre-checks. So what we do is we look across the infrastructure components for things like configuration drift, and then we'll essentially provide recommendations before you hit that update button, recommendations to be able to make sure you're bringing the system back into compliance. Uh, after I do the, the pre-check, I can schedule updates. And again, what I'm doing is I'm updating the full stack, but I have the ability to be able to update an entire cluster, an entire instance, or I can go all the way down to an individual component to be able to fine tune that upgrade to those units that need to be upgraded. So I can operate in a hybrid mode um, if indeed I don't update my entire environment. The other thing I get is I get an audit trail. I get a full monitor and report back because in, in a lot of the uh, regulated environments, I have to be able to ensure that I've applied certain level of updates, certain patches as part of that. That does get, um, included as part of that. And then again, the cycle completes um, as we go forward. All right, last slide, I promise. So um, I just wanted to provide a quick highlight on 5.2. And, and I mentioned in the beginning about how we've accelerated many of the items on our roadmap. And 5.2 uh, went GA in July as part of it. And, and a couple of examples that I wanna be able to provide here, just so you get some context in terms of how we've been able to accelerate um, you know, based on the uh, laser focus that we put within our engineering team. So this first item here is convert vSphere or vSAN into vCF private cloud. Uh, obviously, strategic importance. I can take an existing vSphere or vSAN environment, and now I can essentially bring it in brownfield into a vCF environment and now give the all the vCF controls that I brought into it. So the first phase of that is deployed. So really think simpler configurations um, as part of it, but we're expanding that support matrix uh, as we go forward. Uh, a new edge solution, I know Prashant talked about that before, is the ability to be able to, to essentially not only provide a standard workload domain running out at the edge, but I also now have the ability to be able to run kind of one and two node configurations that go off into these far edge locations. So we're supporting those. Um, sorry, can I, can I jump in? Please. Uh, the edge, um, uh, 
do you limit um, st that the edge can be started from, I don't know, 10 locations, 20 locations? Is there is a threshold that you can use the license? So it, it's a it depends question. The, the response to that is dependent on how, if there's smaller sites, we can support hundreds of those sites. If they're larger sites where I actually have much more uh, control within that site, where I'm, let's say, bringing SDC manager functionality out there, then it does, it's a smaller number of sites as part but of But you it. can start from four sites or three? It's not uh, like you need to start from 20? I can start from one site. Okay. Yeah, we have customers that have deployed essentially a single edge location off of a single uh, VCF instance deployed within the data center. I guess it brings up a question. The licensing for edge, is that on a... How, how does that work? So yeah, so, 100 sites versus yep. 10 sites, is there a different license? So it, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a different SKU, so there, it's a different SKU than the core VCF SKU, priced appropriately, so a little lower price as part of it, and you're, you're essentially paying for what you consume. So if I'm deploying a two-node cluster, let's say I've got, uh, as part of that, I'm only consuming those cores as part of it. Oh, so I got you. If I buy a thousand cores, I'm just essentially notching down those cores as I go to deploy those edge locations. I got it. So All it's right. based I on what you use, okay? Um, I know Katarina's gonna uh, demo this later, but we do have now independent VKS updates. VKS is our uh, internal uh, VMware Kubernetes service as part of this. And before you had to do a vSphere update in order to update the, uh, the Kubernetes stack, now I can actually do that independent. What's the difference between VKS and Tanzu? So ta think Tanzu as the platform as a service. We've actually rebranded the Tanzu Kubernetes grid, which I think is what you're thinking of, to the vSphere Kubernetes service. Again, just to avoid any confusion between, do I need the Tanzu stack in order to do that? No, it's completely independent. I can deploy this, it, it, because of the fact it comes as part of the VCF stack, I don't have to, I don't need Tanzu a, as the ability to be able to deploy it. So it's a basic Kubernetes setup. It, it's essentially, think of it as the Kubernetes, embedded Kubernetes runtime, mm -hmm. but then it's also embedded with a set of services that we'll walk through in the demo on it that essentially allow you to stand up a Kubernetes yeah, environment. But on top of this, you uh, um, install and uh, use the add-ons, right? Like the Tanzu and you, so on. You can't. You, can. you don't have to, you don't but have you can, to. yes, okay. absolutely. Uh, VPCs have been a uh, construct within the, um, uh, the VCF environment now for some time. So we're actually integrating that deeper into both vSphere and automation uh, as we do that. So you're getting better integration there. Uh, live patching, this has been one of the most requested features from our customer base is the ability to live patch a, a vSphere environment so that I can essentially apply a patch without having to shut the VMs down. I can actually do that in production uh, as part of that. Uh, flexible upgrades now gives me much more flexibility in terms of how I can apply those upgrades. We've had DPU support in the product now for about two years. This is the first release where we're supporting dual DPUs for redundancy and for better performance as part of it. 